Hey everyone, Tim from Chamfrazone here. Welcome back to the texturing part of our Star Wars droid tutorial. I am working with Substance Painter 2018 1.1, which is the latest version. And in the last couple weeks, they introduced a new UI here, which is very nice. Uh, they changed a few things around so that certain things are not in the way so much anymore and it's really nicely integrated here to this uh, side panels and other than that it's pretty much the same old substance painter experience so even if you follow my older tutorials i hope you won't have too many problems but you really shouldn't and we are starting with a new project and we're gonna load the low poly model here it is. Next thing is we need to get those details on there from our high poly model. So under texture set settings, which you will now find next to the layer tab here, we go over to bake mesh maps. And this is here exactly the same window that we are already used to from the older versions of Substance Painter. We can then go over here to add our high poly mesh. And I like to bake in two passes where the AO and the thickness map are not part of the first pass. And actually I'm not baking the thickness map anymore. I don't think I really need it for hard surface things. It's more like for organic things. If you want to have thickness around the ear lobes and things like that. So nothing that we really need here for hard surface and with those five maps selected, we can then get a fairly quick bake and make a control. And if everything came out right, we are then baking the time consuming AO map as a second pass. As a next thing, we can then put our resolution here to 4K by 4K, which is very high risk, but it doesn't hurt to have it high risk because we can always downsample it. If you would put it in a game, you would probably use a 1K texture or maybe 2K max, but it's just good to have it available in a higher resolution. Think of, for example, cinematic scenes or just some other use cases where you just want to have the highest details on it. And of course, because this is a texturing tutorial, it's nice to see the details up close and very crisp. So I'm going to have it here at 4K. And I also want to have here our edge padding to, let's say, 32 pixels. That way, the normal map information is kind of stretching out to the sides until it hits another UV shell. And that way, we prevent to have any visible bleeding if that was here set to zero. Especially important for MIP mapping if you put it in a game. So always good to have some dilation width enabled here. Now the next thing would be to put the frontal and rear distance to a different parameter. And people keep asking me like, what's the best uh, way to explain that? And I really can't give much other advice than trying things out. If you bake and you see that anything is kind of cut off and it doesn't look right, the details are not really showing, then it's a matter of changing this here to different numbers. But in general, for me, this number here works very well, especially for hot surface stuff. The way that we were creating the high poly and the low poly here, where we don't have so much different space difference and it should just bake very good with these values here. And other than that, it's a matter of trying it out and see what works. So let's scroll down here. We are going to leave that all here as it is. And we want to put that here to mesh name. If you remember in 3D Max, we gave everything a proper name. For example, hat underscore low, which is the one that you see here, the low poly model, and then hat underscore high. And that way it knows exactly which components belong to each other and will bake them properly. And also our anti-aliasing here should be put to eight by eight for the highest quality. Here you can see these uh, underscore 
suffixes that we added in 3D Max. So that way it actually knows that these are the ones that it should take. And that covers it as far as our common parameters go. The only thing that we still have to change here is under the ID map, we want to have the color source coming from the material color. If you remember in Max, uh, we were actually applying different materials here to our unique elements. And that allows us then with that map here, the ID map to quickly select different materials and apply them here to our texture, which is a huge time save. So I'm just going to go ahead and bake and I'm actually going to fast forward the baking process. So don't be surprised if that takes longer on your end and I'll see you in a moment. And it looks like everything baked properly. You can also check it here if you scroll down on the texture set settings. All the maps here that we had selected in the baking window are now actually filled in here automatically. And our ID map shows with colors and AO map is not filled in yet because we yet have to bake it. And other than that, it looks like it did a proper job here. I don't see anything off and that enables us then to go ahead and bake our AO map as a next thing. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead here and in my case, overwrite the save that I already have. But definitely a good idea to already save our project now. And that way we can quickly recover it if things are crashing, even though that doesn't really happen too often anymore. And they also integrated an auto save feature now here in Substance Painter, which is a nice feature that they didn't have before. So let's go back here to our baking dialog. I'm going to unselect everything that we were previously baking. And I go over here to our AO map. Within these settings, we need to put our self occlusion to same mesh name so that it also recognizes the naming convention that we put earlier in max. And I like to put that here to 256 for an improved quality. And the only other thing that we want to change is under the common parameters here. I'm going to put the subsampling to two by two. That saves a significant amount of time and the quality is still superb. And we really don't need to waste so much time baking that map out. Unless you have a super strong machine, then you can, of course, put it to a higher subsampling here. And I'll see you as soon as that is done here in just a moment. So now we also have our AO map and you can see it because if you zoom in, you will see some fine shadow here where we made those extrusions and where we have a little bit of height difference. And the AO map is important for some of the generators. And also, of course, in general, it just gives more depth to the whole thing to have a bit of a shadow here. And other than that, we have our main channels here, base color, metallic, roughness, normal and height map. And to these channels that we need to do all our texturing here within Substance Painter, we still want to add two more channels to it, which is in particular the emissive so that we are able to actually add some emissive here to those uh, parts where it's supposed to glow. And also we need to have opacity because this thing here is set up so that it will actually be transparent. If you remember how we did that in 3D Max, and then it reveals the inside sphere that we have put there. So that is important to have these two extra channels here. And the only other thing is that we have to change our shader that Substance Painter uses here for the viewport so that we are actually able to see the alpha information that we are going to be working with here. And for that, we go over to shader settings and you can see here that it uses the PBR metal rough and we want to change it to that one here. PBR metal rough with alpha blending. And now that we switched it to that, we will then actually see once we're making use of the alpha. 
But before we get to the actual texturing, I just want to have a quick look at some of the features that Substance Painter comes with, especially for those of you that are completely new to it. For example, you might wonder within our texture set settings, why we have a different resolution here than the one that we actually baked out. And that here just means that we are looking at it in a 2K viewport resolution. If you change that to a 4K, then you get the original resolution that we have baked out that we can actually support. And other than that, you can just take a look at it here in 1K, you can look at it in 512, and you can even look at it here in the absolute lowest possible resolution that Substance Painter lets us display. And obviously that's where it gets really pixelated and ugly. So by default, I usually leave it at 2K, which is a good resolution to do your texturing in. If you put it to 4K, it becomes sometimes a bit slow, especially if you have a lot of layers on it. And speaking of the layers, let's switch to that tab here. Very similar to Photoshop. If you're familiar with Photoshop, then you probably recognize all these different modes here that we can make use of. And also we have our folders and all sorts of things that might be familiar to you in that case. So in order to actually get a certain look here now on our drone, which by default always shows white if you just baked all your textures, we can now make use of different kinds of things. Like we could drag materials on here, or we could make our very own material, which is always a good starting point if you're new to Substance Painter. So let's add a fill layer. And as you can see, it comes here with our color, metalness, slider, roughness, all the channels that we have available and that help us to customize our look. So for example, I want that here to be a red drone. And now let's say you want it to be super chromey. So in that case, first of all, you want to have the metalness here all the way to the right, which makes it then clear to Substance Painter that this is a metallic material here. And within our roughness, we then have the option to make it either a very matte metal or very chromey. So it's really all about being in control here over these sliders and giving it the kind of look that we want to have for it. Maybe we don't want it to be as strong here with our saturation, so we can lower that. And really with that, you can create your very own material here with a certain kind of a look. And we can then add more layers on top here, like another fill layer, where in that case here, we don't have the metalness on. Once again, if I put it here to the right, we have it. But it's always good to work with either metalness all the way on or off. If I put it off here, we still get our roughness, which we cranked up all the way, so it's still glossy, but you can tell that it's not looking like an actual metal right here. It more looks like a glossy plastic. But for the demonstration purpose, let's just put it to an actual metal here because we already added another fill layer on top and it's always a good idea to think of it in a way where you have the metal as a base and then you put the metal coating like a paint or whatever else it could be on top of that. And that coating here, which now is just another fill layer, should then have the metalness turned off. So now we are able to add a mask to that. And on that mask, when we right click it, make sure you actually right click the mask and not here the actual fill material. Then we can add a generator. And within these generators, we have different options. So I'm just gonna use, for example, here the mask builder which then exposes that material here, which right now is set to a white. So for example, let's crank that up here a little bit so we get more information. And if we now go into our actual material, the fill layer, 
we can then change that here to any kind of a look that we want to have. And also once again, control the roughness and that way we can quickly customize it here to a unique look that consists out of two materials, one metallic and one non-metallic, which is quite common here within the hard surface texturing. Alternatively, if we don't want to create those materials here from scratch, we can also already make use of these predefined materials here. So for instance, let's use the iron pure. I'm just going to overwrite the layer that we just created here, the red one. And you can see that this here is already set to certain looks that resemble that kind of a metal look, like a bit of a bluish or greenish tint maybe in there. And of course, our roughness here set to an amount where a pure iron is not supposed to be like a full chrome as it would be if we crank it then further up. But you can see how we are still in control here and we can really make out of it whatever we want. And of course, it's always worth to try out different materials, see what kind of a look we get. If you are here in the selection of a material, you can just override it by clicking on any of the other materials. And that way you can really toggle through it very fast and see what could work. Some of the materials already come with some patterns here built into them that we can then also change around. It's uh, completely procedural. We can even change the look of the pattern itself here. And we can change the tiling of it. We can add some rust and weathering. So you can see that some materials are more advanced than others that are basically just uh, fill layers here. Let's take a quick look here at these smart materials. And what these are is that they consist out of different layers or materials here, which then have like masks and different blend modes here already stacked on top. And that then saved as a folder makes it for a smart material. So if you open that folder, you can then see that we have a dirt layer here. We have this worn surface, which has been created by adding that mask editor here to that material. And the material can also be modified, of course. So for example, the roughness, we can dial it down. And that once again, just shows how customizable everything within Substance Painter is. So enough of all the basics, let's get started with our actual texture. I'm just gonna delete everything that we have here in the way, select it and hit that trash button. Gonna start with a new folder, gonna call it grill, switch over to our material tab and add the raw iron material in it. Now right click the folder, add a black mask and add a mask with a color selection. So now we can select that grill here. And before we add our alpha information, let's also select the yellow stuff here. So now that element is all chrome. I'm going to delete that layer one layer here that we don't need. And let's make a new folder and start working on our alpha that we want to have there at the grill. I'm going to add a new fill layer into that alpha folder. And I'm going to make the same thing as before, black mask. And now that fill layer that we just added in that folder, I want to put our opacity to zero. And now with the color selection, we can then simply select that yellow color ID material and it gives us our alpha. But now there is a little problem, which is that the inner sphere is also gone. Remember we had a sphere in there and that's because in 3D Max, I should have given it a different color. It's both yellow here. Let's press F1 to get into that view and pick color here shows this is both yellow and we need to actually have this as non-transparent. So I'm gonna add a paint layer here 
on top of our color selection, go over to polygon fill and put it here to UV chunk fill and then just slide over that. And that did nothing. I got to put that here to black on the color. And now with that selection, you can see that we actually have it as intended here. There's our inner sphere. And now let's carry on here with the inner sphere while we're at it, or I'm going to call it inner mechanics. Add a new fill layer here into that folder. And let's just make it black or something. We don't have a mask yet, so it basically overrides everything. I'm going to make that metallic, put the metallic to one. And now let's add our black mask here to that folder. Go over here to polygon fill and then make another UV chunk selection for the inner sphere. And we can call that here base, that fill layer. Add a new fill layer on top. Add a black mask to it. And now we want to add a fill here to that black mask. Scroll up to procedurals. And you can really just try out different looks. I like to have this checker pattern here. Looks kind of interesting. And with that, we can go back into our material properties here. And we can disable the color. We really just want to have it mostly for our height information and maybe roughness and metallic. I'm going to crank that height up a bit. And that way we quickly made some interesting details, even if it's not exactly one to one our reference. Let's go back here to our stack of folders, add a new folder on top of everything. Outer rings is what I want to be doing next. So with that new folder here, let's go back to our smart materials this time. And the one that I want is, let me scroll down here. It's the silver armor, which I use quite frequently. Already has some nice little scratches and some subtle wear and tear. Let's also add a black mask followed by our color selection. And let's just select that. So keep in mind that also adds it here on top of our head for wherever we had that mask, that color ID. And that's exactly what we want. So I'm going to continue here with another folder. And that's going to be our outer shell. So basically the biggest part of everything. And on the reference image, that looks to me like something non-metallic, actually. It's more like a very hard plastic. And you can feel free to try out different materials, but the one that I found works very well for that is the latex black. If you see that, it already has some nice interesting wear on it. Let's add a black folder on it as well and our color selection and let's just pick it. So now if you take a look at it, it has some subtle wear already, which is really cool. Like these little roughness scratches and it just makes it for a really nice material. I find also has some interesting roughness information here. You can cycle through that with C to take a look at all our channels. And now you see that we have a few of these white little steps. And that's something that we can easily get rid of by creating a new fill layer. And we just want to put it all the way here to the bottom. And now let's call that base or base filler and just put that to a black and see how that will just disappear here. Pitch black and I want to have no roughness for it whatsoever. And that basically takes care of it. Now our alpha grill still has some fragments here from that color ID. So let's go back to the color selection and crank up that tolerance level to 0.5, which as you can see, gets rid of it entirely. That is something to keep in mind when relying on these color ID maps that it's based on pixels and we have to adjust our radius or tolerance. Let's carry on with another folder called red glow. And I want to put it as the name suggests to red and our emissive information. I'm going to put it also to red. 
So now you can see we get a bit of this glow here already. Add a black mask and same as usual, just select our light here. And I'm gonna do the same thing here with another folder, call it our blue glow. Also add a black mask and a fill layer to it. And I'm gonna have another color selection here for these blue parts and do the same thing as before here. On the emissive, put it to a blue. And then we just need to scroll up here and also go to our actual base color. And we also wanna give it a blue. Can be really any color. So you can put it to green if you prefer that, but let's just stay here with the reference for now. And let's go over, I sometimes like to switch here with F1 with the 2D and 3D view. And let's scroll down here to our inner mechanics folder. Want to do a little bit more work here on that. Go over here to our checker pattern settings. And I'm going to click on that lock here so that we can scale it only on one axis gonna have it 0 0.7 here and 1.79 something like that to make it a bit more square here and let's take a look here at one of the reference images that I found where we can see that there is a bit of a glow in there as well that's gonna add for some extra detail and we can then just go over here to our alpha and actually before we select one let's get back here to our glow folder and I want to add another paint layer here on top of our color selection. And now within our alpha here, let me see if I can find it. It's the shape lines here. And basically I want to stamp some emissive information here into those squares. But before we do that, let's scroll down here to our properties of our brush. And I want to set it here to UV and to texture so that it works better here in our 2D view. I like to work in the 2D view most of the times. It's just more precise than doing that in the 3D view, I find. And we can adjust our spacing a little bit here and the size, just play around with these properties in order to match it here to our square patterns. You'll see in just a moment. We also have control over our line width here and now it looks like it actually fits right into that square pattern here. And I'm just gonna stamp it down here and you see it appearing there in the background. And now to change things up, we can rotate our alpha and put the line quantity to one, change our line width, maybe a bit more once again, so that it fits our square here. And then just zoom in here and stamp it down but we want to be here on our glow actually add a paint layer to it i forgot that and now we get that information also here for the blue emissive and now another thing we can do here is to make a right click add a filter and add a blur that way it doesn't look so perfect because usually with a glow, you have a little bit of a blurry effect around it to make it more realistic if you toggle that. And we can do the same thing here with our red glow. Also add a filter here on the mask and maybe put the blur intensity down a bit, 0 0.11. So now we have some interesting details there for the inner part of that sphere. And once again, it might not be exactly as the reference, but I think it would have been just too much to do the complete high poly there for the inside. So now let's add some extra details that we didn't want to do earlier in Max because we can really do it in a very quick way here in Substance Painter. I'm going to make a new folder, call it Extra Details, add a fill layer, and then Within that fill layer, let's switch it to a black material here, base color, and the roughness, we want to bring it down. 
And now let's add a black mask here to that material. And with that mask active, we want to select another alpha here. Let's scroll up and you can see that double circle here. And that is exactly what we need. We just have to change the properties a bit. I'm just gonna make a stamp here so that you see that it's actually working. But we still need to adjust here our settings so that it looks in accordance to our reference. And for that, I'm gonna have to change our circle out border width here. Put that to 0 0.25 and the circle in scale, we want to bring that down. And now we just have to make the inner circle a bit bigger here, 0 0.5. And now with that, we have exactly that kind of a shape as seen on the reference. Let's get into our 2D view here with F1. And then with our reference image here on the right side, I have it on my second monitor we just stamp these patterns in here where we see them. So the first one would go here. And let's get into our material here, not the mask, the material, and adjust our height information so that it looks like it's actually going inside. So now we have some depth here for it. And what we can also do is here on our properties for the roughness really bring it further down so that this doesn't reflect any light so much. And that just makes for a better contrast. And then we just carry on here and stamp that here in the other three parts. And we are not done yet because there is more of these guys. Let's switch over here to our roughness view just by pressing C. And that just makes it easier to see where we actually place these details because we have this nice white on black contrast here. And that's essentially where we need them here at the sides. We can also toggle here our view mode, by the way, to take a look at the actual normal map here. And you can see how that really stamps in normal map information here, straight onto our texture. And let's just carry on here to add these remaining details here. And that basically saves us a lot of work. Like if we would have done that in 3D Max, it would have just been extra work that we can do much faster here in Painter. And you can see now we have these details on here. That's exactly what we needed. Let's take a look at the reference, those details here. And let's see if we need anything else here on it. We have another one of these rings when we take a look here at the reference, which is there on that ring segment there where we have the silver armor. For that ring, we only want to have the outer ring. So I'm gonna adjust our outer border width. It's not as thick as the others and bring down the inner ring completely to zero. So now we can just stamp away here and add this extra detail. And that leaves us with only one more element here that we want to add through these alpha stamps. So let's take a look here at our reference again. And we have this metallic ring there right next to the other one where the camera eye is. So let's go over here to our materials and I'm gonna add a pure iron material here into our extra detail folder, add a black mask to it and then here with that ring alpha, we can zoom in, maybe increase the width a little bit of it and then just stamp it here into place. Go into the properties of our material, enable height information and then drag that slider a little bit here to the left so that we have some actual depth there as well. And maybe I wanna add a bit more of that so now we can actually see that there is some height information. Minus 0 0.2 might work well here for that. And now what we can also do on top of that is to simulate a bit more depth there in the center of it. 
we zoom in here and compare that with our reference, it looks like there is some more depth. So let's switch back to our other material here. That one with the black color for these guys. And let's go over here to our mask for it. And let's just change our alpha information here to the shape brush, that is the default brush. And let's just make it a little bit softer here. Bring it to something like that here. And also we can change our intensity here and then really just stamp here into that shape. And that did nothing because we need to put it to black, which you can do if you press X, that switches it from white to black, same as in Photoshop, I think. And now we have a bit of this depth in there, which might be a nice touch. So let's make some use of our maps that we baked out earlier to add even more detail here to it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a new layer here on top of everything. Make sure it's a layer and not a fill layer. And I'm gonna call it curvature. Add a fill right onto that layer. And now let's scroll down here to our base color and punch in curvature here or just curve. Add that fill and then here on the layer settings, we're gonna put it to overlay. You can see how that adds some extra detail here and we may not want to have that much information. So I'm going to put it here to 50 opacity. And now we're going to disable everything aside from the color. So now if we toggle it, you see a little bit of a extra detail there. It doesn't have to be much. And I'm going to make another layer here. Going to call it AO. And you can almost guess it. We're going to add a fill and add our AO map to it. Just search for ambient here and that will filter it here to our AO map. Now I'm going to put that to a multiply and we can also disable everything aside from our color information. And then if we toggle that, it just adds a little bit more. And also let's bring our intensity down here or our opacity, I should say, maybe 70 so that it's not super strong, but it definitely adds some nice extra shadow here. Both our curvature and the AO in combination add these extra details. And maybe we bring that further down here on the curvature to something like 35. So now let's see what else we can do. And I would say we carry on with some wear and tear because so far we have mostly a pristine version here gonna create a folder on top of our extra detail folder going to call it wear and tear hat and I want to add a fill layer into it this time we have a fill layer again add another folder into that folder call it hat selection and now drag that fill layer into that folder so basically we have two folders add a black mask on our main folder go over here to the polygon fill Gonna use the mesh fill and then select our hat. Now add another black mask to our hat selection, right click and say color selection, and then pick that dark material here. So only that gets affected for now. Add another black mask here with a generator on it. And I'm gonna use our mask builder here for it. So now you can see how only that black region gets affected. And I'm gonna put that color down to a more darker tone and also put our roughness down so that it doesn't look as nice and shiny where we have that wear and tear now. And that looks pretty good here on the hat. I don't think we need much more than that. And now what I'm gonna do is take that wear and tear hat folder here, right click, and I'm gonna duplicate everything and call it wear and tear body. So now what we can do is also, first of all, rename everything properly, body selection. I'm gonna override that mask, add a black mask here. Go over to our polygon fill and once again with the mesh fill, select the whole body here. 
and you can already see how that takes care of it here. Our color selection for it already has this color here, so we don't need to do anything else. And what we can do within those material properties is add a bit of a height information here. So you can see how that really gives it a bit more depth. I didn't want to have that on the head part, which is why I have two separate folders. Don't think it suits it on the head, but maybe we can add it also here to our inner ring. So I'm going to make another copy here, wear and tear rings. Go over to the body selection, call it ring selection. And now delete that color here for the plastic and just select it here for that ring. So now we are in control over these different elements. Go to the mask builder and I want to bring that curvature amount down a bit so that it's not so heavy. But otherwise we have a nice continuous wear and tear here. And let's see if maybe we want to bring our levels down as well so that it's not so strong. So that's why I wanted to have these three different wear and tear folders so that we are really in control over these individual elements on it instead of just adding it all over the droid here as one. By the way, you can switch it to orthographic view, which I usually prefer. I don't even know why I didn't do it. Guess because it's so spherical, I didn't notice. Now let's take everything here, all our layers, press shift. So you got it all selected and press control G. So that adds it all to a folder here and I'm going to call it our default version. And let's make two different texture variants here of it. So let's close that folder, right click it and duplicate layers. That just makes a perfect duplicate here. Let's switch off the default version. Going to call it Bumblebee, the new one. And you might already guess it. I want to make it a yellow base material here where right now we have that latex black. So let's go to our outer shell folder here and let's see what layers we got inside here. That was a smart material earlier. Let's go to the base and really what we want to do is change it to whatever color we prefer. If you like a uh, blue, you can also go with that. But in that case, I want to have a nice uh, yellow, maybe with a bit of an orange touch in here to get that bumblebee kind of a look here on it. And I want it a bit more intense here, the saturation and with a bit more orange. That always makes for a nice contrast that yellow and metal I find. Let's scroll up again here and customize our wear and tear a bit more here for this bumblebee version. Let's go here to the body wear and tear and I want to increase that a bit, make it a bit stronger here. So let's bring these levels up and also we can change the color, make it a little bit darker and that way it makes for a bit more visibility on there. Maybe bring that up even further here on the levels of our mask builder generator. Another thing we could do is to change it up a bit here. The actual look of the wear and tear where it's placed by clicking on that random button. Since it's all procedural, it will just place it in different places. We might also want to bring the contrast up a bit here. And another thing I want to do is actually mask that camera eye region out a bit here. So I'm going to go down to our outer shell folder and to our mask, I'm going to add a paint. Let's go over here to the polygon fill and just select it. We can do that here within our UV view and I need to have the color on black or else it won't work. So now we have that masked out here but we want that to be metal actually. And I want it to be the same metal as the one here from our outer rings. So let's right click the mask and add a paint here to it. So that now if we go back to the polygon fill, 
we can put our color to white this time and add it back to it. So I think that suits it better than having yellow in there. So I think we could even go stronger with the wear and tear. Let's scroll up and on top of our wear and tear that we already have, we create a new folder here and I'm gonna call it rust body. And let's create a fill layer that we're gonna drag into that folder and then add a black mask, same as usual. Go over to polygon fill and with the element mode, let's select our body. Let's add a black mask to that fill layer, right click it and add another fill. And now we're gonna make use of one of the filters and it's called the matte FX rust. So let's drag that here into our uniform color slot. And right now that doesn't look very impressive. Let's go over to our fill layer, the actual material and change it to something black here. If you want, you can also try different colors, maybe with a bit of red in. So right now it doesn't really have the look I want. So let's go back here to our mask and I'm gonna right click it add another filter and I'm gonna choose the invert. So that flips it around and just suits it better here, the whole thing. Looks like it's actually forming up where we have our divisions. So we're gonna have to do a bit more masking, but first let's go into these parameters and you can see that you have some really good control here over the spreading. And now let's go back to our main mask add a color selection and let's just pick the region that we really want to have for it, which is the outer shell here, the yellow part on that bumblebee. And now we have some nice rust forming up here. Let's go back to the material properties here of that rust and play with that height information so that we have a bit more thickness there and depth. So I don't want it to be so strong on the hat. What I'm gonna do is select that rust body folder, press Ctrl G and I'm gonna call it rust body mask because I only want that to be on the body for now. Add a black mask and then with our polygon fill, we can make a selection here back for the body only. Gonna duplicate that rust body folder and gonna call it rust head mask. Override our black mask and now what we can do is select everything here on the hat and go into these individual folders that we created before and just bring that intensity down here quite a bit. The rust spreading. Like I said, I don't want it to be so extreme there on the hat as it used to be before, but I think that still looks pretty cool here. Maybe even lower than that, 0 0.015. And that way we still have our actual hat here and has all the details showing nicely. Let's go into our color selection here of the hat mask. And I want to also have these silver ring elements here. You could also leave that without the wear and tear. It might actually look cool if it's just pristine there. But otherwise we can play around here with different wear and tear styles for that as well. And now let's just close that rust hat mask folder that we have here just by clicking on that folder symbol. And I wanna have another duplicate of here. Let's go to duplicate layers and I want to have a third one here for our rings. Override the black mask and let's just select the body again here. And now within our color selection, we can just click on that minus symbol here for the gray parts so that only those silver rings here are affected. If we toggle that. And now we have control over that entirely here without affecting the other areas. And I might want to bring that smoothness down a bit same as our rust spreading itself here. And really just a matter of playing around here with these sliders until we like it. Bring down that intensity here for these drips. And otherwise I think that looks pretty convincing here with the wear and tear for it. 
So one thing I want to do is I want that to be black here, actually. So let's go down to our outer shell here. This one, open up that folder, scroll all the way down and right click on our base and make a duplicate of it. I'm gonna call it black and change it to a darker tone here. Doesn't have to be pitch black. If you press C, cycle through these channels, you can see that the roughness for it is cranked all the way up. And to have more contrast, I want that to be only half as strong, 0.5. Press Ctrl G on that black material that we have here now. And I'm gonna call it black masking, that folder. Add a black mask to it. And now pressing F1, we're back into our 2D view here. And with the polygon fill, we can now make a mask here for having this part here showing us black. And now I'm going to go over here to our paintbrush. And I want to do another thing here. First of all, I have to put that to UV and texture again. And let's put the hardness up all the way here on that brush. And I actually want that here to appear also as dark material where on the black version we didn't really see that because it's black on black and here it might be nice to have some extra contrast with that material here for these screws and that is just more precise to do here in the 2d view even though we could also stamp it right in the 3d view but for the procedural things i like the 3d view for some custom work like that here, I like to toggle the 2D, 3D view for it. So now we have our Bumblebee version here. Hope you like it. And you can play around with different glow colors and just customize it further if you want. Let's make another version. Let's copy the Bumblebee. Make sure the actual folder under it is hidden. And I'm gonna call it Woodland Camouflage. And just to show you how fast we can create an entirely different looking version again, let's go here to our base layer, the yellow bumblebee material, if we toggle that. And then up in the properties here, in the base color, let's search for woodland. And that brings up our camo woodland material here. And that's basically already it. We can change the randomness here of the seat if we want. We can even change the color of the camouflage and we can change the tiling, however you like it. And we can also go over here to our rust wear and tear if we want. And also once again, change the randomness of the seat for it. Let me just make sure I'm on the right folder here. And that way we have like something that doesn't just look like a clone of the other, but actually is another version here. So I hope that you enjoyed this latest 100% free tutorial. And I am going to release more tutorials in the future, both paid and free ones. If you want to support my tutorial creation efforts, you can donate a Bitcoin if you want or send something to my PayPal address. It's entirely up to you. Any donation is very welcomed. And other than that, for latest news, follow me on Facebook and on ArtStation or any other places you can find me on. I'll see you soon. Cheers.